Good evening. Welcome to tonight's special presentation. I'm Dani Zitan uh, We're going to take you across. Uh, you know, there are sensitive days these days, these days uh, for the country, a uh, difficult time period given that the economy is taking a bit of a hit. And we have been covering this all throughout uh, the, the new segments within, within this channel. Now, something that we want to give you all a take on our viewers is what the perception is like. And for that, we need to get an individual who basically resides outside our country. And to give us a very important and very analytical take is Mr. Nitin Gokale, uh, the Strat News Global founder and CEO. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us today. Thank you, Dhani. Though it's uh, any other time, I would have said it's a pleasure, but it's a painful uh, time <laughs> right now for the country yeah. that I consider my second home. And uh, it's uh, quite something, you know, what is happening right now is unprecedented. Exactly. Uh, Ms. Didin, a lot of things I want to cover with you uh, on today's program, but um, if we can firstly get your reading on the current situation. Now, I'm, I'm sure when you, when you move around the country, you would see, you would feel the kind of tension that is available and the issues that people are facing. What, what is your reading of the current situation? So, uh, I was quite uh, surprised that the situation, uh, economic situation has deteriorated uh, to such an extent. I mean, uh, in Delhi, uh, where I stay, uh, one doesn't get that complete picture. It was only after landing in Colombo in, in the past three, four days uh, and going around the uh, city and then talking to some old friends uh, and some of the other people here, one realized the uh, depth to which the uh, crisis has uh, plumbed. Uh, and that uh, plunging of that crisis uh, is, I think, uh, something that the people are feeling uh, the after effects of it, uh, which is uh, not something uh, one would like to you know, see in this uh, beautiful country, very warm people. I see that uh, the food prices have increased by more than 20-25%, inflation is high, uh, fuel is not available, electricity, power cuts are happening which uh, to my memory uh, i covered the uh, the period between 2006 and 2009 when elam war 4 was on uh, that time also one didn't uh, have these kind of shortages despite all those hardships those uh, that tension that fear of violence uh, these hardships were not there so it is uh, at first glance an unprecedented uh, and never heard of kind of economic crisis which I do not know uh, whether uh, it has happened overnight or uh, it has a culmination of a series of mistakes uh, of this government as well as the earlier governments. But I, I was trying to read through, analyze, talk to people. And I, I think it's a combination, uh, it's a triple whammy really for the people. And people will not understand this. I mean, let's face it, you and me sitting in the studios can analyze it, get the figures, talk about it. But uh, the common person on the street will not understand. He has to feed his family, she has to cook uh, meals. Uh, so that is very painful to see. Yeah, uh, Mr. Nithil, um, I think uh, a perspective that I want to take from you is now uh, inflation, yes it is high in Sri Lanka and it is affecting uh, all parts of production, be it any, any, any lifestyle has been affected. Uh, what about the situation outside Sri Lanka? Now something uh, so apart from the conversation that we were having before was, you know, when it comes to oil prices, it is not very favorable anywhere in the world at this point. Uh, what is your take on that? So, yeah, I mean, that of course is uh, part of the current problem or the recent, uh, say, a one month long problem when uh, on 24th February, Russia invaded yeah. Ukraine. Yeah. The oil prices really shot up. They have almost doubled. Uh, they have been fluctuating between $100 and $130 per yeah. barrel. Now that is unprecedented again for the nearly eight to nine years these uh, prices have remained below sixty uh, dollars a barrel. Yeah. <laughs> so that was a good time for uh, governments who cushioned themselves by uh, stocking up oil or you know uh, using that time to uh, beef up their, their reserves, economy, yeah. their reserves and their economy. But this one uh, now is creating problems for everybody. You take UK for instance, I was talking to somebody in London the other day. Uh, petrol prices there per litre are something like uh, 1.4, uh, nearly 1.37 uh, pounds. You can translate that, Closing you know, 600, 600, yeah, 530 yeah. or 540 uh, Sri Lankan rupees. Yeah. In India, uh, the uh, petrol prices have gone beyond 100 rupees, which is a psychological mark uh, it has breached. And every day the government has been slightly uh, cleverer in India. It has increased the prices by 80 paisa sometimes by uh, 90 paisa, sometimes by 60 paisa, gradually. And as now, uh, over the past 10 days, 
uh, it has increased uh, the petrol prices by three or four rupees. Right. Uh, so uh, again, in India is also no less uh, hardship uh, inflation. It is uh, adding and contributing to the inflation on other issues. And the food prices have gone up. Uh, essential commodities are going up. So it, uh, it the pain is being felt uh, across the globe. Uh, not just uh, in Sri Lanka, but th th this is a new phenomenon. But I think Sri Lanka's problems are long term, exactly. uh, starting from uh, maybe 2005 onwards okay. uh, and now coming to this. But again, as I said, people will not understand this. They will blame and they ought to blame the current government for not foreseeing the crisis mm. or not uh, anticipating the crisis. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Nitin, um, before we get into maybe like uh, details of the Ukrainian issue and you know uh, the situation in India, maybe if, uh, prices of food across the globe, I want to take your uh, understanding of like, the most recent event that took place, which was the Bimstick uh, Summit. And uh, given that, given the close relationship between India and uh, Sri Lanka, both geographically and uh, across history. Uh, where do you think, uh, what are the remnants of this? Because we didn't see a lot of coverage happening on, you know, uh, where, because this is an important partnership and there was a lot, lot of important details given that the uh, charter was also um, endorsed there. Uh, there was some important comments made by Prime Minister Modi as well. Uh, what is your reading of that entire summit? So I think uh, BIMSTEC is becoming an important grouping. Uh, it is uh, being driven uh, primarily by India and of course the six other nations uh, you are aware, Nepal, Bhutan, Myanmar, uh, Thailand, uh, Sri Lanka uh, and uh, therefore uh, it is an important grouping which uh, looks at the Bay of Bengal and Bangladesh of course, yeah. the Bay of Bengal initiative and um, uh, the uh, adoption of charter, adoption of a symbol or, or a flag or uh, you know uh, an icon for the uh, summit uh, shows in its 25th year actually uh, bimstake was uh, formed in 1997 but it has got traction only post 2016 when india hosted a summit in goa in 2016 and india is actually driving it for one person i mean one uh, selfish reason you can say uh, because india wants to keep pakistan out Okay. and which uh, uh, none of the other countries mind because uh, this I, I uh, describe BIMSTEC as uh, SARC minus Pakistan. You know the SARC grouping is also there. Of course, Thailand is not part of SARC. Yeah. Uh, but uh, what used to happen in SARC was that it was always dominated, overshadowed by the rivalry between India and uh, Pakistan. It would always get into the, uh, the debate between the two and uh, no work would get done. So India, very uh, systematically from 2014, has uh, not attended SARC uh, or has not uh, con uh, allowed uh, SARC to be convened because that has to be a consensus. Instead of that, it has gone to BIMSTEC. Right. Now, BIMSTEC gives uh, everyone a leeway to develop uh, maritime economy, blue economy, uh, maritime security, uh, prevent drug trafficking, human trafficking yeah. and all of these countries have now been individually uh, given one charter or one vertical. Yeah. Uh, Sri Lanka for instance has technology, yeah. uh, India has security, yeah. others w would look at uh, climate change and you know, uh, other cyber issues like that. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a grouping which is uh, on the cusp of uh, transforming itself. Uh, Sri Lanka will play a major part of it because it is also about the Bay of Bengal initiative. Certainly. And Bay of Bengal is uh, on, the, uh, on the intersection of uh, Western Pacific and Indian Ocean. Certainly. Therefore, it is an important grouping. Right. Uh, I think uh, India made, in, made a, an investment also for the fund f close to, I think, 1 billion US dollars. Um, something I want to get your take now, I think the viewers would also really want to uh, understand this. Uh, given that we are in a crisis situation, we've, we've heard government uh, ministers and even economic analysts uh, talking about bilateral relationships and how important it is for Sri Lanka as of now, because that is somewhere we should reach out to uh, in in uh, in at least uh, curbing the sort of situation that we are that the economic situation that we are in. What sort of role do you think again India plays as of now? with Sri Lanka in, in terms of that relationship, in terms of the economic relationship. And where do you think that can be pushed towards to benefit or either help Sri Lanka out of this current condition? I think there is a complete understanding between the leaderships uh, of the two countries that uh, India needs to help Sri Lanka economically. Uh, there would have been some wrinkles in the relationship in 2019, 2020 uh, because of the uh, East Container Terminal issue which uh, Sri Lanka 
scrapped and then gave the West Container Terminal uh, to an Indian company. All those uh, yeah. are behind us now. Yeah. Yeah. The current uh, situation is that India has offered and opened up its coffers, has uh, now uh, a, a cumulative uh, aid of 2.5 billion dollars have been given to Sri Lanka for uh, specific purposes. Buying fuel, credit lines, uh, credit lines uh, has also given um, credit lines for uh, essential yeah. commodities, food items, medicines. Uh, so I think India is uh, opening it up completely and is perhaps will be willing to uh, go further if need, need be. But India also probably made it clear to Sri Lanka's leadership that this borrowing or uh, taking a repayment of uh, their loans uh, will not be uh, sufficient. Uh, Sri Lanka will have to think of long term measures to overcome this problem and that long term measures could be restructuring the debt by going to the uh, International Monetary Fund because otherwise it's like taking money uh, uh, borrowing it from one and giving it to the other yeah. that will not solve the problem in the long term. So I think a uh, lot of discussions are happening between the two countries, uh, the experts are uh, there. Sri Lanka has obviously homegrown experts and uh, economists who will take care of this, I'm sure. But India is willing to uh, go the distance and some more yeah. if necessary to help Sri Lanka because one, it's got old civilizational ties, it's the closest neighbor and uh, both need each other. Let's face it, it's not a one-way traffic. Exactly. Uh, it's not uh, that India is a big country and India uh, has to give Sri Lanka to keep it, Sri Lanka on its side. Uh, it's a genuine friendship and that genuine friendship is now uh, reflective in the way India has uh, stepped up to help Sri Lanka. All right, um, a lot of important things we covered in that segment. Let's take a very short break. You're watching this special presentation that we're having tonight on the geopolitical issues within this region. Stay with us. This is Other Than Trade Flow. Back to tonight's special presentation. We are in conversation with Nitin, Mr. Nitil Gokhale, uh, the founder and CEO of Strat News Global. And he's based in um, Delhi, I believe it's a YouTube channel, it covers a lot of the contemporary issues that are happening across the world. Uh, Mr. Nitin, now if we can take a step further from our discussion, uh, moving towards the region a bit more. Uh, India, a massive uh, as, as a Sri Lankan, I would, I would say we need to bring in sort of Indian investments here, have that sort of relationship going and like there are multiple things that we can discuss on that end. We've already seen, I believe, uh, large scale investments for like the hotel sector within our country. Where else, uh, Mr. Dedin, do you see India as a country moving towards? Now we see, uh, be it, let's take nations like China or even Vietnam, where they would uh, prioritize technology, prioritize production. And we, within this government also, the priority was production. And we need that form of investment to get this, you know, the, that catalyst to like, you know, uh, be there. What is the investment climate like within India and where, where do you think we as Sri Lankans have an opportunity there? Well, India uh, has, uh, has got over COVID, uh, which was also a setback for uh, the COVID-induced uh, you know, setbacks that were there are over now, more or less. The economy is bouncing back uh, and the investment climate there is favorable because India has got uh, several opportunities. There are uh, production link incentives that have been announced for several sectors by the Indian government. Right. So if you come and set up a, a manufacturing unit, uh, say, uh, to manufacture uh, iPhones. So Foxon, for instance, has shifted uh, many of its facilities in um, to India, yeah. large uh, facilities to India. Yeah. Uh, there are uh, automobile companies which uh, have uh, major factories in India. Okay. They are coming in there. Uh, but uh, I think the gig economy is uh, what India is looking at. Uh, going forward and uh, there is enough manpower, skilled manpower available in India to do all that. So anybody wanting and tourism is another sector which uh, can be uh, tapped yeah. uh, as far as India is concerned. But uh, it's same is true of uh, Sri Lanka I guess. Yeah. In India there is one more uh, thing what the government is trying to do and it's the third uh, fastest growing economy um, right now. Maybe uh, the GDP will be the highest uh, in amongst the large economies. Uh, India will be the topmost uh, country. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we are not over the hump yet. Mm -hmm. uh, COVID has been a major setback uh, like everyone else. Uh, 
so India is looking at uh, financial year 22-23 as the as a transformative year yeah. uh, after two years of uh, slowdown uh, that is there. But there are many opportunities in India right now. Right, uh, Mr. Nitin, where, where would you like um, significantly point to? Uh, one one thing I want to touch on uh, is uh, since you referenced uh, tourism, uh, you can speak with your own experiences as well when you come to Sri Lanka because I think the people here would also really like to hear what sort of perception exists uh, for an Indian tourists, um, which uh, which. Uh, very much welcome in our country. Uh, how, what sort of things would you expect? What is the kind of experience that you'll look forward to when coming to Sri Lanka? So I was talking to some of the uh, tourism uh, operatives and uh, tourism specialists in, in Sri Lanka, in Colombo, during this last three, four days. And I was sharing my uh, thoughts and experience. One is that um, because Sri Lanka and Maldives are next to each other, yeah. Maldives attracts, uh, for some reason, high-end uh, and celebrity tourists uh, quite a lot yeah. who go on publicizing uh, Maldives that we are here and you know we are sort of enjoying. What Sri Lanka attracts is a complete package yeah. because it's got various experiences. It's got beaches, it's got uh, wildlife, it's got uh, mountains, yeah. it's got tea. Uh, you can do heritage uh, in tea gardens, uh, that kind of thing. So I believe, uh, and which I know a couple of cases, but I believe uh, it got reinforced here by your uh, tourism specialist that uh, high-end Indian celebrities, high net worth individuals do come to Sri Lanka and uh, hire big bungalows in the tea gardens and you know uh, around the beaches. But they want to keep it quiet. They don't want to endorse it yeah. because they want privacy. But they come for uh, detox. Yeah. <laughs> but there is a huge segment of Indian tourists uh, which uh, needs to be tapped. And that is uh, from tier 2 and tier 3 cities of India. Not the metropolitan cities like Mumbai, Calcutta, Chennai and uh, uh, Bangalore Do or Delhi. The southern regions? The, no, not just southern region. There are uh, smaller cities which are now got people with disposable income. Right. right. But they, have, they do not have enough information about Sri Lanka. Okay. So Sri Lanka needs to mount a major campaign in uh, tier 2 and tier 3 cities like Lucknow, Pune, Hyderabad, uh, Jalandhar, Chandigarh, Srinagar, Jammu, uh, you can, I can name them, Madurai, Coimbatore, yeah. these are, have got Air Sri Lanka flights, they used to be there earlier, mm -hmm. now they must have been stopped because of the COVID situation, but these are the people who want to come, so they would be honeymooners, there would be people who want to go abroad but uh, do not know where to go, uh, the uh, tariff is reasonable here, many of the middle class people in these smaller towns uh, and cities in India, uh, just only know maybe Bali or Bangkok. Yeah. Uh, they need to be wooed. They need to be given packages. Yeah. They can also combine this with uh, a trip, a hop across to Maldives, mm -hmm. which Sri Lankan tourism can actually do. And I, I see a huge potential in that uh, if it is uh, pitched right mm -hmm. and pitched to the uh, correct people in, in a correct time frame, because there are holiday seasons in India, yeah. which can be tapped. Right. Uh, Mr. Nitin, uh, I think that's a very important point, which uh, hopefully will come to the attention of our <laughs> officials as well. Uh, 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 s taking uh, again, uh, moving back to the conversation on investors. Now, uh, something I wanted to get your take on, Mr. Nitin, is uh, this point of manufacturing and uh, production. Uh, what because the emphasis we had on the services sector, which is like the tourism sector, and hoping that that rebound bouncing back from the tourism sector would in fact really support this economy, it would, but it's a more long term sort of uh, uh, strategy there. In the short term, if we had the kind of production that is happening maybe in India or maybe in other East Asian countries, uh, it would have been easier, one would say, to bounce back. In terms of manufacturing, where is India looking at right now? What sort of products are you looking at? I, I believe you spoke of Foxconn and that, that, that was in terms of like Apple. Uh, but what are the other sectors that you know we are missing out on? Or maybe that the Indian market is really like paying a lot of attention to these days? So uh, Indian market also is into white goods, electronic goods, yeah. uh, refrigerators, televisions, television sets, uh, electronic uh, other goods like you know music systems. Uh, India is also looking at uh, electronic, uh, electric vehicles, two-wheelers as well as four-wheelers. Right. Uh, there is an incentive for uh, that uh, which is being offered by India, which even Sri Lanka can offer given its uh, uh, compactness, uh, given its uh, very even climate. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, it's it's never uh, cold here. I yeah. mean, uh, there are no extremes. Yeah, yeah. You know, you can predict what the weather would be like. Uh, there there are enough skilled people, I'm sure, in uh, Sri Lanka uh, who can uh, contribute to it. So uh, there is much like uh, what is happening in, say, southern India yeah. can be replicated in uh, Sri Lanka. So manufacturing can be in multiple things. There could be. Um, like I mentioned, uh, you know, electronic goods, but they could be on uh, other issues like uh, other products uh, which are of day-to-day -day use uh, to the common people. They can be produced here, can be manufactured, but they need incentives. They need a single window uh, clearance yeah. uh, and quick clearances. The reduction that. of red tape. Reduction of red tapism, yeah. red, uh, reduction of taxes. Okay. Uh, unions uh, have to be reined in and you know there can't be an, any harassment. Uh, uh, loans uh, or incentives, let's not say loans, but tax incentives, okay. that if you manufacture so much, uh, then we give you uh, this concession. Those kind of things are required. I think today Sri Lanka is in the situation what India was in uh, July 1991, okay. where India had to pledge uh, and, and transfer its gold reserves uh, to uh, the bankers abroad to secure a loan. Okay. Uh, it was uh, that bad uh, in uh, July 1991, uh, more than 31 years ago. Okay. Uh, Sri Lanka, uh, and then from there on, uh, India just rose okay. because it liberalized its economic policies, its rules, allowed privatization, allowed. See, so the Sri Lankan government has to bite the bullet now uh, in privatizing, in getting the unions to agree, uh, otherwise, there's no other go uh, to privatize wherever possible dump maybe even uh, you know loss making state owned enterprises hmm. india just sold uh, its uh, national carrier air india okay. to the tatas right. it was a, a loss making unit for almost 20 25 years more than 28000 crore uh, rupees were uh, spent in, in the black hole so finally the government bit the bullet maybe uh, that is required those hard decisions are required in sri lanka also people will come they will uh, set up joint ventures and uh, joint ventures can be offered okay. to many of them. So the uh, East Container Terminal has gone to an Indian private company, yeah. which is in collaboration with a Sri Lankan, Sri Lankan company, yeah. uh, company the, and the Ports Authority, as you are yeah, aware. Yeah. Uh, Trincomalee oil farms uh, have been also been given. There are other uh, solar and wind energy farms have been set up in the, in the north. Yeah. So there is huge potential. What it needs is a very concerted effort from the government taking private sector in uh, confidence and taking the hard decisions i think the hard decisions is the hard part yeah. <laughs> uh, and but if you are your uh, if uh, you are uh, with your backs to the wall uh, there is no other alternative i hope this spurs that kind of hard decision from the government yeah <laughs> um, i think a few important um, sort of uh, decisions that you have mentioned there that we can really think about. Um, Ms. Nitin, the, the next question I want to go moving away from Sri Lanka a bit is about the is about global commodity prices. And uh, I want to start off with food, which is, uh, I think, the wheat uh, prices and the, pr the supply of wheat has been heavily affected given that Ukraine, given the, given the conflict between Ukraine and Russia. Do you see the commodity prices, be it for, uh, primarily if we just talk a bit about food, uh, mediating or flatlining at one point, coming to uh, a better level, maybe supply or uh, maybe the supply will actually meet the demand and you know, settle down f in the near future? Or wha what sort of situation do you see there? I think uh, in not in the short term, uh, th this is not likely because uh, the war, uh, while it is more than a month old, yeah. uh, and, and my view is likely to end uh, very soon in the next 10 days or so, okay. given uh, the uh, indications that we are getting. Uh, from both sides. Even if it doesn't happen, the wheat shortage uh, which everybody is talking about or staring at can be made up by uh, India, for instance. India is actually India is actually stepping in uh, yeah. to export wheat uh, in much larger quantities uh, because uh, India has surplus and uh, even that can help uh, Sri Lanka. Again, I'm coming back to Sri Lanka because we are sitting in Colombo yeah, and yeah. talking about it. But uh, the prices will uh, take some time to moderate because uh, you know these are uh, sort of these stocks are bought earlier or they are bought during the crisis. So the prices have been paid already by the uh, by the people who procure uh, these uh, food items. Yeah. Uh, so, but in the long in the medium term, I would think uh, it will settle down. Uh, they have to come down because India has stepped in, as I mentioned. There will be other nations which will come in, and hopefully. 
if the war ends uh, soon then ukraine will also get get back on its feet <laughs> and uh, get that done one um, unknown here is the fertilizer prices they also india also imports fertilizer from russia yeah. for instance we don't know how it's going to get uh, affected because oil we know it's g- has got badly affected uh, but fertilizers are still uh, being assessed the fertilizing pricing yeah that might be a bit of a uh, unknown uh, so we'll have to wait and watch but i am hopeful that the food prices will stabilize mm-hmm. very soon uh is until uh, before we m- go into a break i just want to uh, ask you this specific question also now uh as you mentioned there are a lot of people with disposable income these days within uh, india and you really listed out a few areas that we can target in terms of tourism um in terms of the indian market as a whole a, a massive market a whole close uh, the uh, market that has a diverse interests diverse tastes and certainly something that sri lanka could look at in terms of uh, its export strategy sure uh what what sort of advice or what sort of uh, beliefs do you have when it comes to sri lankan products in general Wh- where are we where can we push further because we are looking at close to maybe about tw- 20 billion maybe like in total exports and we can certainly go past that where where what do you what basically what are the areas that you are looking at is what you are asking yeah. um, again i am not an economic expert yeah, yeah. i am more into uh, security and strategic affairs but my common sense tells me uh, that um, sri lankan handicraft uh, products sri lankan gems yeah uh, also sri lankan tea uh, the high end tea uh, because india also produces tea uh, in large quantity okay. but sri lankan high end tea designer tea if you may call it uh, can be uh, those th- two or three things that i mentioned they yeah. can be one Uh, wood products i do not know whether wood exports are allowed furniture exports are allowed from uh, sri lanka yeah, yeah. but that could be another uh, the third could be garments okay. uh, if if the prices pricing is competitive then uh, garments can be one uh, major factor because uh, the market is huge yeah. i mean and it's uh, diversified like you yourself mentioned into the smaller cities again uh we what happens is uh, the the tendency is to go to bigger cities exactly. bigger markets in india go to smaller cities where uh, there is enough volume uh, but not uh, maybe enough uh, supply uh, yeah. supply there yeah. so that could be one the three or four uh, off top of my head i could think of right mr nitin i want to get your take primarily on the the geopolitical the, the the strategic and the security aspect of the 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 region that we are in we'll take a very short break you're watching this this tonight special presentation stay with us Welcome back to the special presentation tonight. We are in conversation with Mr. Nitin Gokhale, the founder and CEO of Stratnews Global, uh, based in India, in uh, New Delhi. Um, Mr. Nitin, um, some very important segments I believe we passed on uh, in, in, in understanding the situation in Sri Lanka and the perception that exists. Uh, now, if we go a bit to global affairs, because uh, you are someone who has been covering security issues for quite some time and uh, written. multiple books as well i believe our viewers will very much be interested in hearing some of uh, some of those stories but um, one thing i want to clarify because the most pertinent issue that is happening right now is the russia ukraine uh, crisis now what sort of uh, post conflict sort of impacts are we looking at and uh, are we seeing the worst right now or do you think like covid will there be uh, waves of issues that we'll see uh, uh, that we haven't seen right now because you have been covering security issues for quite some time so what is the ripple impact of this thing? well i think um, it shows one thing uh, the russia ukraine uh, crisis or russia's invasion of ukraine is that conventional wars are not over yeah. uh, a lot of people have been speaking for the past decade or so that it's going to be all about drones and anti drones and counter drones and stand off weapons no cyber cyber you know that will be of course the beginning of the uh, the conflict yeah. but eventually you need boots on the ground you need armor yeah. you need tanks you need missiles uh, and that is not going away anywhere that's part one of my uh, immediate take number 2 uh, we are uh, in the midst of uh, reordering of the world order 
uh, the center of gravity of uh, international uh, or global politics is moving to uh, or has decisively moved to the east to asia yeah. uh, and uh, definitely uh, the uh, west led by the americans and uh, and the europeans are feeling the heat uh, because russia china uh, on one hand russia india and maybe even india russia china yeah. Uh, these three are going to be uh, important players uh, going forward. Mm -hmm. There is a churn. Uh, the security situation uh, will, a strategic uh, situation will actually undergo uh, quite a lot of transformation in coming uh, years and decade, uh, at least over the next decade. And uh, fourth is that uh, no one can take uh, security for granted. And I think the old world uh, order post the uh, Soviet Union's collapse in 1989 or 1991 uh, is again undergoing a change and uh, we might see uh, major uh, transformation in the way uh, nations treat each other. In New Delhi we are seeing such hectic activity these days that uh, p uh, leaders uh, from China, Russia, UK, US major important officials are making a beeline to India. So it also shows that uh, if you uh, apply uh, national interest first and put national interest above principles, uh, it will mean that uh, nations can take independent decisions D despite the, uh, you know, the preponderance of uh, global connectivity. Uh, this is going to be the reality that nations will choose their self-interest above uh, what used to be called uh, rules-based order, yeah. uh, also multilateral agencies, multilateral forums. Uh, and one final point I want to make in this is that the United Nations is now completely ineffective. It is uh, remain. It has uh, got reduced to being a talking shop. Yeah. You, we have seen through uh, these crises, uh, co in COVID they couldn't do anything, in, uh, in, in the pandemic, in the current crisis uh, they are helpless. And when uh, China uh, tried to invade uh, parts of India or uh, intrude into parts of India, uh, the United Nations couldn't do anything. So we are fundamentally in the, in the midst of a huge churn which we haven't seen for uh, past, uh, I would say, 50 years or 60 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I think very interesting thoughts on the United Nations, I believe we'll also uh, very much agree in those lines because the uh, specifically when it comes to COVID, uh, we saw that a lot of inaction on, on, on part of the UN. Um, uh, Mr. Gokhale, well, something that I would like to get your take on now, the Ukraine-Russia issue exists within our region and definitely is impacting us, impacting the entire world. Where does India sort of lie or as in, uh, no, as stand. in from, yeah, stand within, within this entire uh, dialogue that is happening between uh, Ukraine and Russia or is it more of a non-interventionist sort of uh, backward sort of role that India is playing? Where, where so it's uh, India is playing a, a role that is not uh, of a mediator, certainly. Uh, India does not have uh, stakes in, in those terms. Yeah. Uh, but India has a stake for stability, for uh, ending the violence, ending the war because of its own economic uh, reasons and because of the global order that needs to be stable. Uh, a stable global order will mean uh, rebounding of the economy uh, which India needs uh, like any other country. And what, what India is doing is, is in perpetual dialogue with all parties. It has uh, done a fine balance uh, in not condemning Russia, at the same time calling for uh, s uh, end of violence and uh, start of a dialogue between the two sides. Uh, it has chosen to abstain from UN resolutions condemning Russia. Yeah. And uh, it is also under pressure from uh, the United States for uh, condemning Russia, yeah. or for not buying oil from uh, Russia. But India is in a peculiar position because it is dependent on uh, Russia on 50% uh, of its uh, defense needs. Right. Defense platforms are either uh, Russian origin or are dependent on Russian space and skills and uh, their expertise. Okay. So therefore, uh, India is not going to take a position which uh, will be dictated by the West. 
India has taken its own position and that's where it stands. But And the very fact that everyone from UK Foreign Secretary to US Deputy National Security Advisor to uh, the Chinese Foreign State. Minister of China, uh, Foreign Minister of Russia, yeah. uh, the Secretary of State speaking to Indian External Affairs Minister yeah. over phone over the past two, three days shows that uh, India's stand uh, is justified and it is a stand that uh, countries like India will have to take there is no other alternative. It cannot afford to take sides in this conflict. Right. Uh, Mr. Nitin, though you mentioned that, I think uh, you're very much aware of the sort of dynamic that exists between the West and uh, the most Eastern p parts uh, and most Eastern countries. Uh, one would say, an analogy that they can draw is, okay, right now, nations such as Russia, nations such as the United States are looking to count who their allies are. In, in moments like this, and even uh, in, in intense moments like this, this yes. would actually result in uh, something terrible. Um, in in those lines, with little, do you think diplomatically we have seen that India is very strong? Uh, that balancing act can be done by the nation of India. It, indeed, it can be done. Uh, India is doing it. Let me point out uh, the fact that uh, while India is uh, not condemning Russia. Uh, it is an uh, important partner in the quadrilateral dialogue between United States, Australia, Japan and uh, India as the fourth partner. Yeah. It is also a uh, fulcrum of the Indo-Pacific as the United States would like it to be. Okay. Uh, although uh, it doesn't have the capability as yet to influence uh, outcomes in uh, the in larger Indo-Pacific, it can do something in Indo Indian Ocean but not the Western Pacific. So, uh, it has uh, got uh, that fine balancing act. Uh, United States uh, also wants uh, India to purchase uh, military platforms from United States. It wants technology to be shared uh, by India. Uh, it is also transactional, of course. But India is uh, playing this fine balancing act, the multi-alignment uh, role uh, that is in India has adopted is, I think, the right approach for a country like India which cannot afford to antagonize either. Yeah. Uh, so that is, I think, a fine diplomatic uh, balancing act it is playing. It's a tightrope walk, but uh, it has so far managed to stay on the rope yeah. and not <laughs> fall off. <laughs> uh, Mr. Nitin, the next question I want to ask you is, uh, now leaving our sort of uh, viewpoints aside, uh, India and China, both very important parts for, more important partners for Sri Lanka. Um, Again, leaving our interests aside, Mr. Nitin, do you, is, is, we have seen sort of the impacts of the trade, sort of the trade war that happened between US and China. Where does India and China fit in, uh, in terms of their relationship in towards the future? What sort of relationship do you witness as maybe uh, not only being in India, but even like analyzing this as a journalist? Where do you think it's heading? Do you think there, there have been tense moments in the recent past, but do, will we see that occurring in the future? What sort of relationship is So, uh, it's been a roller coaster ride. It's been uh, up and down between India and China since the 1950s, late 1950s. Uh, there was a war in 1962, and the past 30 years, until uh, from 1993 to till about 2020, it was quite a uh, stable relationship in terms of maintaining peace and tranquility in uh, the border areas, which is uh, one of the largest disputes, the longest running disputes of uh, border between two countries. Yeah. Uh, but uh, currently, post-2020, uh, there is a lot of trust deficit between India and China, especially by India. Uh, India does not uh, trust China's words because its actions haven't matched the words. Okay. It has intruded into, uh, uh, into areas which uh, are Indian. Uh, which India, of course, has uh, sort of beaten them back from there, uh, prevented them from coming further. Uh, they have adopted the salami slicing strategy of uh, distant frontier areas uh, being occupied by uh, China for uh, one reason or the other uh, since 1950s. Uh, in the current crisis, uh, it will take a long time to regain that trust which existed for these last 28 years, as I mentioned, from 1993 to uh, 2020, 2021. Uh, but uh, I think now China is a little keen to uh, renew the ties. Uh, it wants India to start afresh yep. its relationship. But India has made it very clear that until the resolution of the border issue uh, of the current vintage is done, 
India does not want to uh, start afresh because uh, it does not trust China. <laughs> That's the reality. But in the long term, uh, the medium and the long term, I would think this grouping that I mentioned, India, Russia and uh, China, uh, would be more important for the global uh, stability uh, than uh, the other nations because Russia might become a junior partner of China for various reasons, for economic reasons, for military reasons, for strategic reasons. Uh, but India cannot afford to become a junior partner of China. Right. Now, that's where the complications arise and we'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. But uh, so far, it's a very interesting um, kind of development in the past uh, three years or so, and especially in the past uh, two months. Right. Um, again, a very important segment that we passed there. Ms. Nitin, we'll take a very short break. Please join us on our last segment. You're watching tonight's special presentation. Stay with us. Welcome back. You are joining us on tonight's special presentation. We are in conversation with the founder and CEO of Strat News Global, Mr. Nitin Gokhale. Um, a very interesting discussion thus far, Mr. Nitin. Um, something towards our closing sections, I want to get sort of your long-term vision of where, uh, in security-wise, economic-wise, this region is going to sort of position itself. Um, if we talk a bit, we'll start from India and we'll move on from that point onwards. Uh, in towards the next few years, and be, I believe given that India is one of the largest countries with, with a huge population, they don't make plans to, you know, maybe one year or two years, but looking long term, where, where do you believe India would like to get to in the next, within the next decade, both security wise, economically, even politically? Where do you think the, the pathway is leading to? Well, I think uh, what India wants it for itself is uh, two or three things. One is um, uh, consistent economic growth uh, could be uh, about eight, seven to eight percent consistently over the next uh, 10 years. Uh, in the short term, it wants to become a five trillion economy by uh, the initial aim was uh, 2025. Uh, but it may have to be pushed by a couple of years or at least one year. Yeah. So that is the immediate aim as far as uh, the Indian government is concerned. Second, it needs to secure its borders uh, further. Uh, the long festering uh, border issue with China needs to be settled. India wants to uh, settle the line of actual control as it is called. China is not playing ball so far. But that could be one priority. Uh, the other would be uh, to um, uplift uh, as many people out of uh, poverty uh, as possible because India is witnessing currently one of the largest migrations from rural to urban areas and India is going to be one of the largest urban settlements, urban areas uh, anywhere in the world in any other country. Mm -hmm. uh, the numbers are huge, humongous and uh, that's where I think the Indian government is concentrating on providing livelihoods providing uh, good living, uh, at least comfortable living, and uh, smart cities. Uh, that's uh, the number three uh, uh, aspect I would think of. Fourth could be uh, climate change. Right. One of the major uh, challenges countries like India face is to balance between uh, development and uh, ensuring uh, or protecting climate change, yeah. or protecting against uh, you know, the climate change uh, which is coming so thick and fast. And the fourth point I would think is to have a secure neighborhood, okay. uh, good relations with all the neighbors, uh, not overbearing, but uh, as a friend, as a, as a partner. Yeah. And uh, the maritime uh, domain of Indian Ocean, which is India's uh, sphere of influence, needs to be uh, guarded against by um, India for any kind of uh, foreign presence or intrusion could be uh, from China, for instance. So these are the five priority areas I can think of uh, in the short to medium term as far as India is concerned. Uh, Mr. Nitin, uh, something that came to my mind when, when you were explaining those areas was uh, now since y you an expert area for you would be security, uh, Sri Lanka's current government was also very careful about addressing extremism within the country and this was brought up within the Beamstek Summit as well. Our president really mentioned this what sort of impact or what sort of uh, 
uh, window is available for extremism to either be present or to rise within this region? What, what do you believe? Uh, is that something of concern according to what, what you see? And if so, what needs to be our priorities? So, oh, well, that danger always remains because of political uh, ideologies. Uh, not so much of uh, because of religion, but political ideologies that uh, do not want the nations to develop or nations to progress. Uh, that danger is ever present. And in that context, I think uh, Sri Lanka, India are in a very sweet spot uh, because both governments uh, understand the uh, necessity of uh, intelligence sharing, yeah. uh, information sharing and prevention. Uh, so there are various uh, mechanisms in place. Uh, while the Coast Guards uh, collaborate with each other, cooperate with each other, navies and co Coast Guards, there is also the mechanism of the Colombo Security Conclave, which uh, has a secretariat based in Colombo, uh, driven primarily by Sri Lanka, uh, meant for Indian Ocean region, where we have now, uh, it has expanded from being a trilateral maritime cooperation between India, Sri Lanka, Maldives, to uh, include Mauritius, uh, maybe in the future Seychelles and Bangladesh and possibly Indonesia, yeah. uh, which will mean the entire belt of Indian Ocean region would be uh, well connected as far as information sharing, intelligence sharing is concerned. Yeah. So that would be a priority area. And I think Sri Lanka is well aware that Sri Lanka can be used as a staging ground for attacks in India uh, by extremist elements. So again, there is a lot of uh, intelligence sharing and intelligence activities that uh, are coordinated. Uh, by the governments, which uh, is, a, is a very good thing. There's a lot of understanding. Uh, it's not something new, but it has now gathered uh, pace, uh, faster pace than ever before. Uh, Mr. Nitin, uh, we are coming to the close of our program, and in c towards the conclusive side, I want to, again, bring the discussion back to Sri Lanka again. Uh, where you see the bilateral sort of relationship of Sri Lanka and India heading, where you believe are important aspects that we need to focus on. Because as we spoke about the UN, uh, Sri Lanka has been, according to us, <laughs> it has been harassed uh, in the UNHRC many times, multiple times. And it has been a big issue for us, given that we, um, uh, we advocate sort of the extreme measures that we went to to protect the civilians within this country. Um, Having keeping that in mind, and India being a very important partner mm -hmm. for Sri Lanka in in the, in the long term, even in the short term, when it comes to sessions within the UN, where do you believe this relationship can head to? Where do you think it is heading to? It is, uh, as I mentioned, in uh, a very comfortable position at the moment on various aspects. Uh, in uh, Sri Lanka's ambassador to uh, uh, New Delhi, Melinda Morogoda, actually uh, articulated an uh, India strategy. Yeah. Uh, in a very uh, well drafted uh, document uh, prioritizing areas in which both countries can work. There is a civilizational connect, uh, Buddhist, uh, the Ramayana circuit for instance, there is a Buddhist circuit, we share a lot of civilizational uh, commonalities. Uh, that's one aspect, people to people contact uh, are very good and uh, connectivity in terms of uh, flights and uh, ferry services can improve further. Uh, and India uh, will uh, remain a trusted partner as far as Sri Lanka is concerned when it uh, comes to defending Sri Lanka uh, in the UN. Uh, d despite the fact that a couple of times India has abstained, yeah. hasn't opposed uh, the resolutions against uh, Sri Lanka. But that's the position that it had to take uh, given domestic compulsions. Uh, every government's foreign policy is also driven by some domestic compulsions. So uh, that is understood by uh, people here. Yeah. And I think uh, I can't see anything um, uh, really uh, derailing the good India-Sri Lanka relations, uh, or even uh, I would say very good India-Sri Lanka relations right now. From here on, it can only go up rather than uh, get into some kind of an obstacle. So I'm very hopeful on that. Right. Mm -hmm. The CEO and founder of Strat News Global, Nitin Gokal, thank you so much, sir, for joining us. I think it was a very important, a very fruitful discussion that we had with you. Please uh, join us once again when you visit Sri Lanka. Thank <laughs> you very much for having me, and it's been a pleasure. <laughs> thank you so much, Ms. Nitin, once again. Um, thank you to our viewers for staying with us. I think it was a very important session, a lot of important things that we covered within this session. This has been a special presentation. Stay with us on Other Than 24 as we continuously cover the news in the country and continues to cover the situation in Sri Lanka as of now.